I have to tell you that this global AI enclave was part of my unfinished agenda as minister and it, I just ran out of time. We had launched the India AI policy and uh, we were going to do a global AI conclave that was uh, going to lay out the vision of the government of India on AI and I couldn't do it so thank you for doing it. Uh, so you're uh, in some sense completing an unfinished part of our, my own agenda. Now look, after I've uh, exited government, uh, thanks to the voters of Tiruvannathapuram, uh, uh, I am still very much active in politics. I spend a lot of time in Kerala. I, that is uh, certainly my political karma boom, if you want to call it that. I am not uh, an active venture capitalist. Uh, I don't want to go back there just yet unless somebody tells me in Delhi that uh, that's where I should go. Uh, I am very much uh, in politics and uh, public life, and I hope to continue to do what I did before, a minister, before I was a minister, which is to shape the policies of the government of India, uh, to continue to catalyze and expand the innovation ecosystem in India. And those are things that I'm deeply passionate about, and I hope to continue to contribute to that. Right. In fact, you know, the whole India AI mission was launched when, uh, when you were at the helm. How far have we come so far? It started off with an ambitious outlay of, you know, over 10,000 crore. What's, you know, what's the progress been so far and what more should we do? No, so I, I, I certainly have no inside uh, knowledge about how far it has progressed, but uh, what the Prime Minister has certainly laid out as his vision uh, is that after eight years of success of the India DPI, the Digital Public Infrastructure, uh, which has really transformed government and governance in, in our country, that he believes that the next wave or the next phase of reimagining governance will come from AI. And so he has very clearly in his vision, which is what catalyzed the India AI policy, uh, a future where governments would harness the transformative power of the DPI as we know it, but with AI embedded in it. So a much smarter, a much more reimagined form of governance is what I believe is the end game for our Prime Minister. Where we are specifically, I think that question should be addressed to the Minister right now. I don't have any inside view, but I think his mission is very clear and that continues to be the mission. Right. I, I think Santosh spoke about frugal LLMs, you know, in his uh, welcome note. And there's a huge debate around LLMs and what India's approach should be. For instance, um, Nan the likes of Nandan Alekani and Naran Murthy believe that, you know, let the big boys in the valley fight over LLMs. India should, you know, focus on applications and use cases. And this is a sentiment echoed by the Mary Secretary as well. He said, we're not convinced if we should expend resources in building an LLM. But the other side of the debate is, you know, why is India not focusing on foundational tech? Why, are, why do we have a services mindset always? Where do you stand in this? What should our approach be? Look, uh, as far as the government is concerned in the GPA summit in New Delhi, where the Honorable Prime Minister spoke and laid out the vision of AI for India, he said that we are not necessarily focused only on research and broad innovation but we are laser focused on the fact that AI must transform people's lives. Uh, as was the case with DPI, we believe the same for AI. And so therefore use cases and building, uh, and I certainly don't want to get drawn into this zero sum argument about small language models, large language models, should we leave it to the West to do this and should we leave it to the West to uh, somebody else to do that? I, I believe it's a, uh, with great respect to the people who push that argument, it's a little bit of a waste of time. We are focused and we must focus on real use cases being solved with AI. And within government, we, government has identified a number of areas which are very rapidly digitalizing or already have significantly digitized where there are huge amounts of data sets that are just ready to be uh, used to train models that will help the government deliver public services better and vector them sharper. So uh, the government of India's view on AI within government is very use case focused. And the odds that the government is going to intervene and say we want a large language model or a small language model for this type of research and innovation, I think will not be 
arising from the government it will be a private sector initiative and they could come back and ask the government for support right financial ai compute infrastructure access and so on and so forth so that is really for the innovation ecosystem to take care of but the government just to summarize again is very very laser focused on harnessing the power of ai to improve its own governance vis-a-vis -vis public services yeah in fact my follow up question was on that you know the theme of the conclave this time is from hype to impact ha has it moved to impact at least in the private sector we are seeing some use cases uh, but in terms of governance you know how else can we use this because we already have the rails uh, yeah. we have dpi what can we do on top of that yeah and so and i think that's one of the things that the, the risk of sounding like a little bit of a wet blanket i think there is this hyperbole and there is the hype and the and which is fine i, I mean i i, I think any new technology certainly there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of people uh, who who get behind it uh, for the transformative power that it represents and i i spend a lot of time every month traveling around the world in invi being invited by governments that are absolutely um, uh, non intuitive in the sense that these are governments you don't expect to be excited by ai i'm i'm traveling in december to visit three countries in africa to talk about how ai can transform their governance so everybody certainly is today excited about what ai represents what i continuously tell any audience that i get an opportunity to speak to is that while there is this broader ai movement and 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 you know as, as it was 30 years ago with the internet uh what we should be focusing on at least for people who are really serious about using this technology to impact uh, create some impact is on use cases and that discipline the rigor about identifying the use cases building an architecture and strategy to create an ai application for the use cases really is where a lot of the effort should be uh, you can have a lot of the rah rahing and the cheerleading continuing but in the next 2 to 3 years india must be able to demonstrate as it has demonstrated with the dpi how ai has been harnessed and the transformative power as experienced by the common man and the citizen then ai will be successful otherwise it will be hmm. like you know many companies and enterprises uh, uh, talking about ai and i'll explain to you in the indian context why it's important for the government to be successful chandra if you go back to fintech and what was the trigger and the catalyst for the fintech ecosystem in india it is prime minister narendra modi ji in 2014 saying i want to solve the problem of how to send money from the government to a billion indians without intermediation so jandan yojana dbt evolved into upi and now you have this multi billion dollar fintech ecosystem if the government of india and its governance embeds ai successfully around 5 6 7 use cases i can assure you the innovation ecosystem in india is the one that will benefit from it because the applications the models will be built designed architected by the ecosystem right in terms of regulation uh, do you think our existing laws are enough to tackle deep fakes yeah no i think that's a this is a very powerful important question for anybody any nation any country including india that is hoping to build an ai ecosystem we cannot build one without guardrails we can't build one without the do's and don'ts being very explicitly clear to those who are building platforms whether it's the private sector or it's the government and uh, i think we have done one part of that ju jurisprudential framework which is the dpdp bill the rules are yet to be notified but there are certainly gaps in our legislative and judicial framework jurisprudential framework about non personal data and monetizing of it scraping the internet and monetizing of publicly available data publicly available information but without uh, the counterparty who has produced that information or owns information benefiting from it so there are some gaps but those are gaps that we understand as a government i mean i shouldn't keep pointing to myself as a government but uh, to the government uh and i think it is uh, it's a safe assumption that those gaps will be plugged in by either amending existing legislation or new legislation but certainly i recommend and i'm this is the wrong audience to be saying this but i recommend to governments 
and of course to the government of India when I was a minister that we need to create the rules of the playground very clearly so that while innovation gallops forward, makes the positive impact, the negative impact, the misuse, the deep fakes, the misinformation, uh, that there are rules and let us say punitive consequences for those who indulge in that. Right. Um, you know, in 2023, I think you brought up the issue of how big tech should fairly compensate media houses. And we've seen that issue uh, being raked up again. And of course, we have a vested interest in this. But Canada, Australia, you know, they already have regulations to tackle this issue. So what, again, what do you think we should do? No, this is the point I made, that I think uh, if a television broadcaster broadcasts something on a free-to-air channel, uh, does that mean I can just appropriate that content and use it to train my model? The answer is no. So when somebody does that on the internet and somebody then uses that publicly available information, uh, transforms it into data sets and trains a model without really compensating who created that, whether it's a micro-influencer or, mic or money control or a larger uh, corporation, uh, that is certainly wrong. Uh, but is there anything in place that causes the model trainer or those who are using it to train the model to compensate for that publicly scraped uh, information? Currently, no. That is the gap that I refer to, that we need to plug that gap. Otherwise, what you have is uh, what you saw on the social media phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, you know, today, social media gives all media companies a, is a heartache and uh, headache. I mean, because they control 67% of all advertising rupees that are spent in India. So you certainly don't want a situation where the big LLMs scrape the internet 10 times over and have created such critical mass, then they don't care about whether you go protest to uh, any court about your content or not. You don't want that situation to arise. That is certainly not, that is too much of a concentration of power in one or two platforms and that is not a desirable outcome for any democratic society, any uh, rule-bound society and I think that is a gap that needs to be discussed. It should not be one way. Uh, the Australian government did it, in my opinion, slightly unilaterally. Yeah. But I think in India we can have a discussion around that for a couple of months. Uh, I know there will be some people who will kick and scream about it. But keeping in mind the rights of micro-influencers, influencers, individuals, small organizations, the big guys like Money Control, CNBC, everybody. There has to be some model where those who scrape the internet and train their models using information that has been created by somebody uh, has an, have an obligation to the original producer of the content. Right. Final couple of questions, sir. What AI tools do you use on an everyday basis and for what purpose? No, I spend a lot of money on, I, I think, I believe uh, it's becoming a, a little bit of a pain spending 5,000 rupees a month on open <laughs> chat GPT, but uh, I, I use chat GPT perplexity and pretty much everything that uh, I get my hands on. Uh, and I love to prove them wrong. I love to see sometimes when they <laughs> get it wrong. Uh, it just proves that uh, this belief of AI, almost like a religion, uh, is dangerous. Uh, they are effectively... Uh, trained by what they scrape and so if it's garbage in it's garbage out if it's <laughs> good stuff in it's good stuff out so uh, it's early days uh, so this you know I had a chance to meet um, Sam Altman in, in, in Delhi and he was evangelizing uh, um, very effectively to a group of people in government and uh, I, I think to start believing that it's all perfect is a little too premature. We have to be naturally skeptical, uh, question, and at the same time as government, like I said, focus on use cases and really get this stuff to make impact. Right. Finally, you know, here's a question that perhaps an AI tool can't answer. What's your prediction for Maharashtra? Uh, no, I don't need an AI tool for that at all. I think uh, I go with something even more, uh, less predictable, which is uh, exits, exit polls. <laughs> and, uh, not not they, just they are, in India. They are <laughs> even worse uh, trained by data sets. I don't know if they have data sets, but they certainly have uh, very questionable models. No, look, I think uh, it's, it's very clear. Uh, nobody wants to go into the chaos. Karnataka, the state I, I see, is like a beacon of chaos 
for the rest of the people of the country to say we don't want to go down that road so people of maharashtra are certainly going to say we don't want to be like karnataka and we want to go with the prime minister narendra modi and the bjp great on that note thank you very much thank sir, you. sir as always thank you chandra